Good afternoon all and thank you for joining us today for this event co-hosted by the Atlantic Council Counselors Program and the Scowcroft uh, Middle East uh, Security Initiative. I'm Suzanne Kiampor, BBC Washington reporter, and we have gathered today an extraordinary group of people here to engage in conversation with Shabtai Shavit, former director of Israel's Mossad and chairman of the board at the International Institute for Counterterrorism of the Interdisciplinary Center, Herzliya. I'd also like to thank the mayor group for sponsoring this discussion that will focus on director Shavit's new book, uh, Head of the Mossad in Pursuit of a Safe and Secure Israel and a host of regional issues, including the recently signed Abraham Accords. We've reserved time for questions for Director Shavit after the panel. So I invite everyone to submit your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the event. And if you're watching one of our live streams on YouTube or Twitter, we welcome you to tweet your questions to us using hashtag AC Mideast. And before we turn to our panel, uh, Ambassador James Woolsey, Jr., former director of the CIA, will introduce Director Shavit. Okay. When I took over as a director of Central Intelligence uh, for the U.S. Uh, some 40 uh, or so uh, years ago, uh, I wasn't sure how things were going to go. Uh, we had just had uh, the Pollard uh, case and uh, rather substantial tensions between uh, uh, Israel and the United States, uh, and particularly in the uh, uh, world of intelligence. And um, my uh, concerns were uh, not only alleviated, but deep-sixed, uh, because I uh, started everything with a uh, walk in the garden. Everybody starts with a walk in the garden walk in the garden with Shabta. Um, he was uh, a delightful guy. Uh, he uh, was articulate, he was smart, um, he was shrewd, uh, he was open and fair. And uh, we uh, had a great walk in the park. Uh, that uh, uh, kept going in a sense, that walk in the park uh, for me for a couple of years, for Chef Tai for several years longer than that. But uh, the intelligence business is uh, not an easy business to manage. And it's not uh, something that you can deal with in a, a casual fashion. You have to care about your colleague. Uh, you have to care uh, about uh, uh, your uh, people on your own side, uh, and you have to level uh, with them. You can't uh, just let things uh, uh, noodle it along. Intelligence uh, is especially important in these days and times. We uh, were then, to some extent, and are now uh, embodied in a dealing with the world of terrorism and uh, terrorists can cause uh, terrible pain, suffering, and death. Uh, and you don't know when they're going to come upon you, whether it's 9-11 uh, uh, or a, a, a terrorist attack in Israel or, or both. Uh, and I think uh, it's also now in this world of uh, uh, essentially technology fear that we have to be very, very careful to deal with that problem, that we are in a world of, of intelligence death and we can't just live it in a comfortable and easygoing and bureaucratic way. We are not the State Department. And uh, we are, I think, in a very, very troubling world. Uh, we uh, have uh, just published several books in the United States, including one by uh, uh, me and my uh, uh, counterpart. Uh, and each one in its own way shows how dangerous things can be, how dangerous they are. We uh, have therefore 
to make sure, we have to make sure that we are dotting every I, crossing every T, and moving in the depths of concern and allaying the fears of our citizens and our gover other government officials, but not allaying them too much. We need them realistically afraid. So uh, with that for now, I'd like it to, to turn it over uh, uh, to uh, my colleagues and let them uh, uh, talk, John and others, as they wish. And uh, I'm uh, especially uh, happy to be able to uh, start off uh, this uh, round of uh, discussions, to start it uh, uh, with Mossad, uh, to start it with uh, John Deutsch, to start it uh, with uh, several people that uh, really uh, matter, both uh, to me and uh, to their countries. Thank you. Well, I'm... Uh... I'm amazed to uh, to see here uh, friends that uh, my friendship with them uh, goes back uh, decades, and they, uh, um, I, I'm 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 very moved to uh, to see uh, these two uh, gentlemen, uh, Jim and uh, and John, and I feel. Uh, I feel very proud to to uh, to have them making the effort to uh, agree uh, to this to 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 attend this uh, uh, meeting and uh, and talk. I recall the uh, the years that we were cooperating together to the benefit of uh, our two countries. Um, and I am proud to say that uh, we did everything possible that our contribution contribution to the security of the United uh, United States will will be not smaller than the opposite. And. Uh, it's not for me to judge. It's for Jim and John to to judge and to uh, 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 address this uh, this uh, um, this point. Um, very many memories uh, from those years, and uh, the one that uh, Jim uh, mentioned, uh, the polar the polar affair is not uh, is not one of the uh, pleasant side of uh, the cooperation. I, uh, I recall uh, the uh, discussion on the topic and uh, I, I recall that uh, I told the, I told Jim that uh, I pray that uh, no other head of the Mossad will need to be in, in, in this same situation that uh, I was there. I recall uh, very many meetings and discussions and uh, 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 and activities with, uh, with John during his uh, tenure as the uh, um, director of the, uh, of the CIA. And um, Especially one uh, one vignette, if you if you like, yeah. during uh, one of his of his uh, visits to uh, to Israel, he, all of a sudden he, he asked me, uh, "Say, can you uh, can you introduce me to one of uh, of your experts on uh, on uh, satellites?" and uh, I was uh, I was very much surprised because uh, um, according to our system, the Mossad is uh, does not have any uh, any responsibility in the in the field of uh, satellites. But uh, nevertheless, I, uh, John asked and I uh, obeyed and I brought one of the uh, of our people with whom he uh, was sitting uh, talking uh, 
for an hour or so. And uh, then he, uh, he told me, listen, uh, uh, if I had uh, a dozen of this kind, I would can uh, I would have, uh, be able to uh, to do even even better than what I'm doing now, which uh, for me was uh, the uh, a compliment that I I, I would uh, I could ever uh, uh, dream of. So uh, um, hello Jim and uh, hello John and uh, it's it's wonderful to to uh, see you and. Um, I pass the uh, microphone to you again. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Director, and we're so happy to be with you and your wonderful book uh, here today. Uh, congratulations um, on the publication. I want to begin, Director, before we go to the panel with a few questions. You in the early 70s were posted to Kurdistan in southwestern Iran. Tell us what you learned about Iran why you were living there, its people, and what surprised you. And if you were to attend dinner this evening with the Supreme Leader, what would be your objectives at that dinner? And what would you specifically, given your background, be analyzing about the Supreme Leader? Well, I, I, I think that I'll start with the uh... Uh, with the uh, second half of your of your question, if I uh, if I would have sit with the with the supreme leader today, I would do my utmost in order to get a uh, a hint or a better understanding to the following question: If and when you are going to have the uh, military nuclear capability. Are you going to behave pragmatically or messianically? I believe that this is the most important question to understand to all those who, uh, who, who sit on, on, on chairs where decisions are being made. Because uh, there is, a, there is argument, argument among the, among the experts. There are those who, uh, there are those who uh, would tell you that the uh, Iranians are pragmatists and they can bring you uh, an example or two from, uh, from the history. For instance, the case that uh, people bring as, as, a, as a proof is, is that uh, in 2003, the Iranian made a decision to stop the development of the military side of, of the uh, nuclear uh, uh, project. And they did it because they believed that the uh, uh, second Gulf War, um, meaning uh, the attack, the American attack on, the, on, on, on Iraq, was only the starter of a much wider uh, operation and uh, Iran most probably will be the, the next target of, of the uh, of the Americans. So this is a proof of uh, a pragmatic kind of thinking. I don't uh, I don't really accept it. I uh, we have a uh, we have a country that uh, is being run by Ayatollah. Shiite, Shiite I had to lot, and I, I stress the uh, the definition Shiite because the Shiite is is considered in in the, uh, various uh, different uh, religious group uh, in Islam is it is considered to be uh, one of the maybe the most extreme in its beliefs, and uh, just to just to give an, an example. Uh, the, the supreme leader, according to the Shiite belief, is considered to be infallible. In other words, whatever he says comes straight from the uh, mouth of uh, Allah. So uh, 
would it be far-fetched to imagine that uh, once he has got the uh, capability, he wakes up uh, in the morning, calls his guys and tell them, listen, I had a, I had a uh, talk with uh, Allah tonight and he uh, instructed me to push the button. So uh, go fellas and push the button. This is what is meant by, are he going, is he going to be, uh, to, to behave pragmatically, rationally, or is he going to uh, follow the, the Shiite uh, uh, Islam tenets and, and, and commands? Another so, point, okay. another point that, uh, that uh, we should bear in mind is the, that the Shiites divide the world into two camps. Uh, the camp, the camp of, uh, of Islam and the camp of the infidels. They don't distinguish between Christians, Jews, uh, Amharis or whoever. The world is two um, camps. One is the, or, or two houses. In, in, in Arabic, it's uh, Dar al-Islam and Dar al harb Our people who understand a bit of Arabic will will uh, uh, vouch that uh, I spell it, I, I uh, pronounce it correctly. I, and, and those who live, those who live in the house of uh, Islam uh, are instructed by, by the Shiite belief to fight the infidels in order either to convert them to become uh, uh, true believers, or else to make do with them, to kill them. And the purpose of this war, which is considered to be eternal, is at the end of it, when all the infidels will disappear from, uh, from planet Earth, they, they'll be able to build the eternal uh, Muslim caliphate. At, uh, every time that I, I, I I, I, I tell this story, I feel like, uh, like telling a story from, uh, from, uh, from Middle East times. But this is, this is the true story today, every day. Well, and, okay, go on. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, in your book, you lay down so many key uh, hallmarks of when uh, you've laid the groundwork for the Abraham Accords. And given that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is visiting the UAE tomorrow, uh, even that I'm sure in your lifetime you, you had hoped for an Israel Prime Minister to be visiting uh, a Muslim country. Um, do you see a future, Director, where Mossad, the House of Saud, and the Iranian people can coexist in the Middle East to fight extremism? And do the Abraham Accords advance that future? Look, let, let, let me tell you the following. Um, I and my predecessors and my successor, all of them visited all those countries. All the visits were, uh, were, were clandestine, were, 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 were secret visits, but, but relationship, uh, relationship and contact between Israel and between most of the countries, the Arab countries, uh, uh, were a place where we, uh, we used to used to meet and used to sit and used to talk and used to to dwell on on, on uh, war and peace and uh, what can be done in order to you know to uh, uh, to achieve to achieve peace. Uh, the situation today. And I, I, I pray that uh, Netanyahu would, will take this opportunity in order to, you know, to um, uh, pursue the, uh, the objectives which I refer to. Um, this is a unique point of time where a, a new axis in the Middle East which, being, which is being led by the United States and where Israel and Arab countries, the moderate ones, the Sunni ones, 
uh, share the same the same objectives and the same targets is is a, is a really a unique that should be uh, that should be uh, a, a, a taken and 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 done. But for that, the uh, U.S. administration have, have first to uh, to uh, study it and uh, and uh, to uh, to accept. It. So I want to turn to and bring in Anna Schefter from NBC News. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Um, give us your thoughts, Anna. I know you've looked at this on Israel-China relations. How has that evolved um, since the time uh, of COVID? Uh, how has it evolved? And what do you see as uh, the balancing act Israel has to play? And I know you want to then ask the director a similar uh, realm in that question. It's such a great question uh, that you pose. It's a fascinating dynamic and balancing act because economics come into play, intelligence come into play, so many factors. And uh, there are so many different players that have to be either appeased or um, Israel has to be wary of. Um, so actually, Director Shavit, I think you are posed to, to answer this in a really interesting way. Can you, can you share a little bit about what the Israel-China relationship was like when you were director and, and how it has evolved and how do you see it now? Well, um, I'll uh, start by uh, saying that um, the intelligence relationship between the Chinese and Israel started during my tenure, and the uh, and the uh, initiative came on the side of the Chinese. They asked via an uh, intermediary, uh, usually in the world of intelligence, there are intermediaries who are making the, the connections. And they, uh, they ask such an inter intermediary who, uh, who came to me and asked me and told me, listen, the Chinese uh, want to establish uh, intelligence relationship. And I uh, told him, uh, uh, let me think of it and then um, we'll come back to you. And uh, by saying uh, I think of it, I meant that I uh, would go to my uh, prime minister in order to, in order to report and to uh, recommend that uh, we should do it and, uh, and then to give uh, an answer. And uh, the first meeting was between, between myself and, and my Chinese counter in a third country. And uh, when we sat together, and after niceties, I, uh, I told him, uh, I told him, listen, we, we can speak uh, according to the uh, uh, foreign ministry uh, protocol or to look at each one at, at, at his, uh, other, the, the other eyes and to, uh, to speak like uh, like uh, like we people who, uh, who 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 speak straight and uh, and uh, uh, don't hide their uh, feelings. And he, uh, after a, a, a minute of uh, second meeting of 30, he turned to me and told me, let's uh, shoot at, it, at each other straight. So I, I, I told him my first question is the following. We are such a small country and we are such a small uh, intelligence organization and you are the uh, the largest country in the world uh, demographically and uh, geographically what uh, what was the reason that you uh, that yeah you why were to... they interested yeah what, 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 what kind of of, of, 
of communication and cooperation uh, we can have with each other. By the way, in brackets, I'll come back to this, but in brackets, I can tell you that in another meeting after a few months, I brought up, up with him the, uh, the issue of the of the Uyghurs in the Western province of, uh, of China, which are considered to be, they are Muslims and they are being persecuted and they are being considered by the, by the Chinese as a terrorist and, and, and opposition. Mm -hmm. And once I brought up this question, he told me, listen, we consider it a domestic issue. We don't, we don't bring it up. We don't discuss on it with, with foreigners. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Okay, yeah. now I, I come back to the uh, uh, to the first meeting, and uh, uh, he tells me, um, since you are straight with me, I'll be straight with you. Uh, our our main priority, I'm I'm talking now about 1991. He told me our first priority is Western uh, technology. And uh, you are very advanced in in in, in uh, technology, uh, and you have uh, you have uh, excellent relationship and cooperation with the U.S. And we are interested also in American technology. Back in '91, the first meeting between two heads of two different intelligence officers, they they didn't hide what was their ultimate goal then, which exists today as well. It puts you in an awkward position. <laughs> Indeed, it does. I want to turn, Will, to you, Will Rich, uh, former U.S. Treasury attache to the UAE and Oman. And Will, you're very well positioned to talk to us today. How do you see the economic relationships between the Gulf states in Israel in particular evolving in the years ahead? What sectors will thrive? What role will the Gulf sovereign wealth funds play? Uh, will the U.S. get cut out of these economic deals? And then I know you have a, a question for the director. So, Will? Yeah, uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, you know, political and security interests have brought the governments of Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain together in the Abraham Accords, but it's really economic interests that will truly tie these countries together um, and, and the broader region together. Prior to the Accords, the Middle East and North Africa region had one of the lowest rates of trade within its region in the world, with just 5% of exports from MENA countries going to their neighbors. From when the agreement was signed in mid-August until January, trade between the UAE and Israel has topped $272 million, which sounds like a huge figure in, in just five few months. But the fact is that much of that trade was, was largely already occurring. It was just happening through intermediary setup in Cyprus, Jordan, and Lebanon, among other places, to get around the longstanding embargoes. Those firms are in the process of moving directly um, to the Gulf, uh, largely here in, in Dubai, where I am, um, and that will have some immediate but, but fleeting benefits. In the short term, the deal is great for Israel, which already has a lot of developed firms and products that are really just in need of additional markets. It's going to be harder for Gulf-based and, and other MENA firms to penetrate the um, Israeli market because of how developed not just the competitor firms are, but the financing, research, and technology development ecosystems around them. You mentioned the sovereign wealth funds, and there is a potential role for them to play, but you know, I don't think they're really situated well to foster the type of innovation-driven economic activity that the UAE and Bahrain are, are moving towards. The GCC sovereign wealth funds are generally um, pretty risk adverse and invest in a very long term time frame. And with a few notable exceptions, like the UAE's Mubadala, they aren't really in the business of driving innovation through direct investment. That's really the job of private sector venture capital firms. And last year, Israeli companies attracted about $10 billion in venture capital funding, while the entire uh, MENA region received about a billion. And that's really just not enough to spur the type of innovation economy that the Gulf states are, are moving towards. So in the medium to long term for the Gulf, it's all about creating the conditions for success. And Israel and the United States can play huge roles here. 
providing partnerships, education, licensing, uh, research and technology, and being the source of venture capital because obviously US venture capitalists invest worldwide. To attract that investment, there needs to be further improvements to the business climate in the region, including modern bankruptcy laws, intellectual property protections, and, and major state investments in research and development that can be spun off into companies years down the line. And as I mentioned, some of that has already started, but it's not finished yet and will take some time to have an impact. So in the short term, the added costs um, of indirect trade are being removed. But in the medium to long term, there are some additional business climate investments that need to be made now um, to really reap the benefits of the new trade relationships. I think the accords are um, a step in that direction. And obviously, the, the first step in the right direction is, is the most important. Um, as for my uh, question for uh, Director Shavit, I'd, I'd like to shift to the, the COVID-19 pandemic for a second and, and really touch on something we were talking about um, before the, the session started. I think it's fair to say that as the spread of the virus gained momentum, it went to the very top of intelligence collection requirements of every major intelligence service in the world. So it's not a surprise that the Mossad and, and your successor, the, the current director, had an active role in obtaining vaccines and protective gear. But what is surprising is that the Mossad's role would be publicly acknowledged both in the Israeli press and by the prime minister directly. So Director Shavit, would you please explain why the Mossad was well situated to serve a critical role in Israel's COVID-19 response and why the Israeli government would have chosen um, to go public about that role? Thank you. Look, I, I, <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't attend the meetings where, where those decisions were, were made to, uh, to engage the Mossad in, uh, in uh, running around the places uh, all around the world in, in, in order to, uh, to bring uh, medical staff uh, and so on. From, and and from my, from my uh, answer, you, you pretty much can understand that uh, um, not only it surprised me, I was entire, I was completely against it, but uh, I, I am not in a position of, of, of decision making today. In the survey, but in, it was it was entirely uh, um, not necessary. And judging from the successes, I I am uh, I'm sure that uh, that my viewpoint is 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 uh, correct. There are so many other issues that the Mossad should uh, spend its time on that uh, this was uh, this was not necessary it might uh, might have given some uh, you know flavor of uh, of uh, uh, operations and and, and sting operations and and clock and dagger dagger kind of, uh, uh, operations too not, Great. So, not, not more than that. So I want to turn, Director, to Halim McCroft. But I, I, excuse me. I just, I, I just want to add, want to add a few sentences. It's, a, it's a good opportunity for me to, uh, to be, uh, to be transparent and to tell you that among other scenes of mine, I'm involved in business these days, and one of the, uh, one of the, uh, and and the. And I, I'm I'm connected with uh, with the uh, Israeli company who, who sponsors uh, this event, and they, uh, I've been to uh, I've been to the Gulf, but the Gulf that I uh, knew was uh, almost a, a desert. There was no skyscrapers, there was no highways, there was no it was half a desert. Um, so. Uh, Personally, I'm, uh, I'm 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 very much uh, triggered to uh, uh, to visit again and to see how it is uh, uh, there. And when when it comes to business, I I do have some ideas and suggestions to uh, to to recommend to to the average Israeli businessman as how to operate in this kind of markets and not so much from the point of view of uh, of finances 
but from the point of view of relation between human beings. Well, the wedding market between Israel and the UAE, as we discussed, is booming. And so uh, I think that is one market that I would certainly uh, look for a future investment. Uh, Halima Croft, I want to bring you in, Managing Director of RBC. And, you know, Halima, talk to us about the current energy price dynamics. Uh, you know, there was recently an important OPEC meeting. Saudi opted to hold their bowels off the market. Uh, Halima, what do you think this means for pricing going forward, potentially the willingness of Iran coming back to the table uh, as it, it's getting a measure of financial relief? And then I know you have a question for the director. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you so much, director, for joining us today. As you mentioned, Michael, I mean, oil prices have moved up, you know, rapidly this year. One of the biggest you know, stories we've seen is the reconciliation between OPEC and Russia just one year ago, I was actually in Vienna and then in Saudi Arabia when the Saudis and Russians could not reach an agreement to put a floor under prices and to make a significant production cut. You know, we've seen since April when they announced that 9.7 million barrel a day agreement that OPEC unity with Russia has largely held together. Now, I think there are some important geopolitical dynamics we can talk about as you know, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov is now in the Gulf. But we've seen really recently the Saudis, I would say, really take back control of this oil market. And I think a crucial decision that the Saudis made was in January when they announced that they would do a unilateral 1 million barrel a day production cut. We had seen already Asian demand recovering. We had seen optimism about the vaccine. But I think it really was the Saudis saying, like, we are going to provide additional rocket fuel to this market, you know, with their unilateral cut that really has given us this sort of bounce. And at the last OPEC meeting that we just, you know, saw last week, there had been question marks over when Saudi Arabia would phase out that cut, when OPEC would start putting more barrels back onto the market because, you know, Russian officials had indicated a, a desire to start, you know, ramping up output again, I think with an eye to U.S. shale growth. But the Saudis came out and essentially said they're going to hold those barrels off the market. They are focused not on discussions about are we in a new super cycle for all commodities, but really shots in the arm. And so, you know, the fact that the Saudis are willing to keep those barrels off the market signal that when those barrels return, it'll be a slow phase return, I think is giving, you know, additional support to this oil market, which raises, I, I think, a very important geopolitical question, which I actually would like to ask the director about, you know, in a, a rising oil price environment, we have been seeing Iran, you know, in the last, you know, quarter, really putting more barrels on the market. Like, yes, they remain subject to U.S. sanctions, but we have seen an increase in Iranian barrels making it into China, for example. They seem to become more adept at getting around these sanctions. And so the question I have is, you know, what will Iran's willingness be to come back to the table if they continue to circumvent sanctions in a rising oil price environment? And do you really anticipate that we will be looking at some type of agreement, you know, with Iran and the P5 plus one that could lead to more meaningful sanctions relief? Or are we going to be in a sort of diplomatic stalemate over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months? So thank you again for joining us, Director, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Well, the, uh, the Iranians uh, will uh, reciprocate um, on any topic of uh, of a future negotiation based on uh, and what the uh, other party w will will uh, propose to them. Um, in this respect, I can uh, I can tell you that uh, um, I I don't I don't know about the uh, more articulate uh, uh, negotiators than the Iranians. Um, they. Uh, they can wear out any uh, partner with whom they they negotiate, and then knowing a little bit the uh, the Americans, uh, uh, the Americans does not have the ten percent of the patience for negotiations uh, 
as compared to uh, to the Iranians. Uh, and I and I I'm telling it to you because I have learned my Farsi in the uh, Iranian bazaar in Tehran. And there, <laughs> one of the one of the first things that I've learned is the the art of negotiations of them, which is based on 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 uh, on, on uh, patience and perseverance. Um, you you may <laughs> you may know that uh, the best carpets are Iranian carpets, and why are they so so good? Because those who with them are kids, 10 years old, eight years old, 11 years old, with very small hands. So they can, 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 can make the smallest knots of, of the threads of the, of the carpets. And uh, a, 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 a small carpet can, can take a, a year to weave. Think about the, the patience that one needs in order to uh, to do it. Only the Iranians know it. So, if one day soon, I believe, the negotiations will uh, will remain, will will uh, resume. The uh, the uh, the only one prediction that I can make I can make is that. Uh, the uh, the Iranians who really want to change the situation and and really want to uh, to uh, uh, um, um, reach an agreement, but uh, they they would only uh, be willing to to uh, uh, to give anything. If uh, the balance between what they get and what they what they give is uh, on their on their uh, side, I don't know if I if I satisfied you with this answer, but this is my answer. No, I think I think that was great, uh, Director. I want to turn to Hagar Chamali, who's CEO and founder of Granite Strategies, and also former Treasury colleague of mine and someone that knows a lot about Hezbollah. And there's been talk for years and years now on the question of Hezbollah and Israel preparing for a second showdown after the 06 war. But it's been almost 15 years. And if that were really true, wouldn't it have happened by now? And so Hagar, I wanna ask you, you know, what are Israel's goals here when it comes to Hezbollah containment under, under you know, mine to influence operations? Um, you know, I'd love your sense of, is there going to be mutually assured destruction, uh, but without nuclear weapons, Agar? And then I know you have a, a question on Hezbollah for the director. Thanks, Michael. Um, and thank you, Director Shavit. I'm so excited to be here. So as the director agrees, and he has said this before, Iran has two major goals, um, and that's to take over the Middle East and become a nuclear power. And sometimes... I find when people talk about Hezbollah as part of the Lebanese fabric um, or Lebanese society and that we have to somehow magically convince it to become only a political party, that they are missing the fact that Hezbollah is an arm of the Iranian government. And without that, it will basically cease to exist, or at least it would be an entirely different entity. So it poses a real threat to Israel for that reason. And quite frankly, to Lebanon, but that's not what we're discussing today. Um, but eliminating Hezbollah, to me at least, doesn't seem achievable ever. And if that were the case, it would have been eliminated at some point during its nearly 40 years of existence. And you see lately, um, I'm sure I'm sure many people have seen this, a lot of analysts saying that Hezbollah's influence has been undermined uh, over the last few years as reflected by the protests in Lebanon and, uh, you know, visions of, of their involvement in corruption and criminality, and uh, certainly the falling economy there, uh, their involvement in Syria. And while that's, there's, it's true that there's been increased disaffection, their hold on the political situation in Lebanon has never been stronger. Um, and so now we know that, which brings me to the point about this showdown, that, that 
both sides are allegedly preparing for. We know that they've been preparing for the possibility of aggression. Um, and given the fact that it hasn't happened and that there have been since then small skirmishes or possibilities that could have ignited conflict and they still didn't result in conflict, it means that there's some kind of false stability in the fact that conflict between the two would be so extremely dangerous. So, the, you know, but at the same time, you see the more Hezbollah arms itself and the more Iran develops its nuclear program, that false stability that you have, this kind of bizarre containment, could really rock, you know, things could really shake up there. So, you know, the thing that I view is that, the thing that I keep thinking is that, on one hand, the international community needs to hold Iran back even further, right? This underscores the argument for that um, and certainly prevent its nuclear program from moving forward. But also it makes me wonder how far ahead Israel is thinking on what, how a stronger Hezbollah could look, what that would mean for them, um, and perhaps whether a new balance could be achieved or some kind of containment if Israel finds perhaps moderate partners in Lebanon, um, uh, which is something, you know, and not a lot of people have written about that. It's something I'd like to explore personally. So I'm sure Israel is thinking of this, um, but I fear the repercussions of a stronger Hezbollah are sooner than many appreciate. Which brings me to my question to the director, which is, how do you think Israel should be approaching Hezbollah from a broader strategic standpoint? What should the overarching goal vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah be uh, on the part of Israel? And is there something you would change in Israel's current approach? Well, I'll, uh, I'll, do my, I'll do my best in order to be uh, short and uh, and concise uh, in my in my response. Um, the the Hezbollah phenomenon is a, a phenomenon is a is a story of a, 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 a small minority in in Lebanon of Shiites who uh, decades ago was the uh, the 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 weakest and the uh, uh, and the most um, undeveloped and 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 economically retarded in in Lebanon and from that position within few uh, decades they have become the number one power in the country and th that is not uh, that is not a big deal because uh, when you when you try to identify the other powers uh, today in Lebanon, you can hardly find any who, who can compete with the with the Hezbollah. Now, strategically and militarily, we consider Hezbollah as, as being a uh, Iranian division. Uh, they, they, uh, 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 it means that uh, they operate under instructions and orders that uh, come from from Tehran so when we are when we are making our intelligence estimates and evaluations the uh, one of the major uh, uh, parameters that we have to uh, consider is Iran and not Hezbollah because Hezbollah for all practical purposes is, is only a tool in the hands of uh, of uh, um, Iran. One, two, we don't want um, uh, um, another another war or another round of uh, of uh, fighting with uh, with uh, Hezbollah. Um, Hezbollah on their uh, on their side, they don't want at this point of time. I'm saying. Uh, uh, Today they they don't want either to uh, to break up the uh, the 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 situation. The uh, uh, we are we are doing everything possible and uh, to very uh, large extent with uh, with your country's cooperation to uh, to build the uh, to build up a. Uh, a defensive uh, system and capability in order to cope with uh, with the most advanced uh, uh, missiles that uh, that they have, and they have a huge quantity of uh, of uh, surface-to-surface missiles, and with 
with uh, precision uh, 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 systems and so on and so forth. So we are not uh, sitting idle. We 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 are uh, investing uh, a lot in 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 uh, in in uh, building the uh, answer to that threat. And the third the third point, and and this is this is my personal understanding. And director, that ties really well into bringing Will Weschler in, the director of the Middle East programs uh, at the Atlanta Council. Will, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I want to pose to you, will the Biden administration continue the Trump administration's efforts to encourage normalization between Israel and the Arab countries? And do you think the Abraham Accords contribute more generally to peace in the region? And then I know you want to direct that to the uh, director uh, before we close. So uh, yeah, well, if, thank if, you. If, uh, if this development of the uh, of the uh, upgrading uh, upgraded relations between Israel and the Emirates and others will be leveraged correctly. It can become a, 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 a springboard for for uh, the end of the never ending uh, uh, crisis between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. So, Director, let me let me just jump in on that because I think your point is a very strong one. Um, I think that the uh, just to answer Michael's question, I think that the um, that the Biden administration uh, will certainly continue um, uh, to try to seek normal greater normalizations between Israel and and a number of other states in the region. I don't know that it's going to be as willing to upend. Uh, long-standing um, uh, U.S. policies in order to do so, as as did its predecessor in some instances. But I do think that it it shares the um, it sees the value uh, certainly of such normalizations. And I also, just as you were just starting to say, Director, think that um, one of the one of the unfortunate circumstances right now is that the, the leader the leaders in the Palestinian community and the leaders certainly of the Pal of the Palestinian Authority and of and of Hamas are responding very negatively to um, to these uh, normalizations and and don't see it in their interests. In fact, um, there, it's easy to imagine circumstances in which over the longer term, it, um, it, it works to benefit the Palestinians and address the longstanding Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I was very, by the way, I, I read your book. I thought it was, I thought it was really excellent and um, I encourage other people to do so. Um, and one of the, and of course it was written before the Abraham Accords came out, really? but uh, but you were prescient um, in writing it um, that you noted that first and foremost, many uh, states, especially those in the Gulf, you you wrote were um, were tired of the Palestinian uh, effort and and ascribed really? more uh, more criticism to the Palestinian leadership than was probably really? uh, appreciated, and you also talked about how the the Gulf Arabs and especially Saudi Arabia could play a really unique role. In a, in a, in ending uh, or, or addressing this conflict, can you can you explain a little bit more about what you wrote and what you're thinking now? Well, um, today I think differently as, as compared to uh, a few years ago because of the new development of the, with the with the uh, Gulf states and 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 the change of and the change of guard in the in the in the White House and and I I. I, I my recipe is not an an instance an instant uh, um, uh, operation i'm talking about a long term process in the middle east where you start with building a new axis american israeli middle eastern uh, uh, sunni moderate Arab countries, Saudi Arabia included. Once you have it, once you have it, a, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians will sit together and it was a situation where such a pressure will build up on the two parties that they won't have any other choice but to but to uh, assign to end the conflict based 
on the idea of two-state solution based on the uh, uh, Arab League or the Saudi proposal of uh, 2002. It's, it's a long process and uh, uh, the, the, the rate of success is based also on the notion that this uh, structure which I uh, which I uh, am talking about will not only be a regional one it will affect the global situation US vis-a-vis -vis China and 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 Russia US vis-a-vis -vis not only Iraq but Turkey as well which is undergoing a uh, a very rapidly uh, process of, of, of uh, uh, becoming a, uh, a Sharia country. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm talking about building a, a mechanism and, and, and dynamics which will certainly will bring once and for all the end of, of, of this conflict. Thank you, Director, for such insightful comments, a uh, fascinating conversation. Um, I recommend everyone uh, buy this. This is a wonderful book and such, such important uh, attributes that you made during it. I want to thank our esteemed panel so much for joining us today. And Suzanne, I'd love to turn it over to you to close. Uh, thank you very much, Director. It was a dear pleasure. Suzanne? Thank you to our panelists and thank you to Michael for that engaging conversation. And I also want to thank Director Shavit for taking the time to join us and share some of your uh, insight and incredible stories with us. As a native Farsi speaker, I would love to hear your Farsi. And if I end up getting an interview with Ayatollah Khamenei, I will ask your question on your behalf. Um, and, you know, it was interesting you mentioned that the Iranians, the, you learned the art of negotiation from the Iranians and how they have patience and perseverance. I covered the um, nuclear negotiations and traveled with Secretary Kerry. And I, I remember the moment where I saw that moment where the Iranians kind of took the lead in terms of the upper hand in the negotiations. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the uh, Biden administration builds on the Abraham Accords and what the future of foreign policy, American foreign policy will look like, which is actually the subject of a documentary I am hosting for the BBC, which you should all watch. Um, so on that note, this event will also be available on uh, Atlantic Council's event page if you want to rewatch it again. Um, what rewatch certain aspects of the conversation and thank you all for joining us. And I can uh, bid you farewell in Farsi. Khuda hafiz. Khuda hafiz. Perfect ending. Thank you again, Director. <laughs> thank you, everyone.